Everyone, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Edward Neal. Um, Ed is a part of the, I'm going to embarrass myself, Shingman Institute. Very nice. Okay. Apricot Grove for English speakers. <laughs> <laughs> he works with uh, Dr. Zev Rosenberg, who many of you may know, um, as one of the foundational teachers for Pacific College of Oriental Medicine. And Edward just happens to be visiting us um, from Portland, and we're hoping to see more and more of him. So, um, very, very, very pleased and honored to have you speak today. Thanks, speaker. And um, I feel like I'm at a, a very strange dinner party. <clears throat> you know, like in the movies where like there's a dysfunctional family and the wife is sitting like a football team away from us, <laughs> and then there's the child in the middle. You know? <laughs> This is a very long table. Please pass the piece. What? <laughs> and my voice is not very loud, so if you can hear me down the down. So um, it's really great to be here, and um, uh, it's exciting to speak with you. I know there's a lot of uh, talent in the room, and I don't think we get the chance to get good feedback. So I would really like to speak more. I'm here to have a conversation more than lecture at you. I have a bunch of things to say, but uh, I would really like to dive in and, and um, benefit from your expertise in your different fields. So, please, let's just do that, too. Um, how many people were able to read the article? Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, these were a series of three articles, two of which have been written for the Journal of Chinese Medicine. I was over there last spring, and uh, they said, oh, can you, this possible acupuncture, that's interesting, could you do that? It's coming out in a month. <clears throat> And so I said, okay, so, but then I realized after starting to write the articles, we were really trying to reshape the whole field in a certain way. Or not reshape it, because uh, it's functional as it is. But if you, the basic metaphor is if you think of Chinese medicine as a redwood or a tree, um, what we're studying is the root system, and what we know is the branch system. So <clears throat> probably most of you don't know the history of Chinese medicine and how it came to the West. Uh, and you've probably heard the term TCM, traditional Chinese medicine. And but probably most of you don't know that that's a relatively recent invention. <clears throat> and it was invented during, and the, that term was invented in the 50s and 60s to describe a certain kind of medicine that was a synthesis of government um, policies. And that there's a whole world of Chinese medicine that exists before that. So actually the one that's most widely disseminated in the West is really, really the most recent. So the first thing that we have to say um, is that there's four basic phases of Chinese medicine, and you really have to define what you're talking about. <clears throat> and then, of course, even within these phases, anybody who's in the Chinese medicine world knows there are so many different camps and different kind of lineage systems and uh, understandings of things. Uh, it's, it's quite immense. But in general, you can divide the Chinese medicine into four basic phases. And where I work is in phase one, in the origins. <clears throat> the origins were about uh, 2,000 years ago, roughly, 2,000, 2,400 years ago, in that time period. Um, and that's when the original principles were set down. Um, and uh, a lot of the information during that time was lost. Uh, but one thing did remain, uh, there a few things did remain, of which the Yellow Emperor's inner classic, Hong Yi Aging, is one, the main one. And that's where I do most of my work. It has 162 chapters and a lot of detail. It's basically a book about space-time motion. <clears throat> so people don't understand that, so they have a hard time reading it. It's written in an ancient script, which most people can't read. Uh, so there's a lot of difficulties in interpreting it. But it's very, very rich, frighteningly rich, I have to say. I read things where they're describing how embryology works. And I don't quite see it. <laughs> how did they know that? You know, how did they get that right? Um, and then there's stage two. So after the, the origins phase, there was a long history of imperial dynasties in which people took the original writings and developed different schools of thought and so forth. And then there, we have to also include, uh, and this is a very abbreviated version, uh, we have to also include phase three and four, which is how Chinese medicine developed since 1949 when the communist government took over, and how that's different in China than it is in the West. It's very different. In China, when you go to training, you, you go through kind of a Western medical training, and you're trained to have prescribed medications, and you work in a hospital. And in the West, we have the model of TCM education that we have in the West, and so they're very different. 
<clears throat> so that's number one. Now, which one would you think is the most advanced? Well, you might think it was number four. Depends on your definition of advanced. Yeah. What's that? Depends on, yeah. yes. Because actually, number three and four, they're the kind of the end result of many stages of things that came before it. But actually, you know, from my perspective in working in this field, it's really clear that number one is by far the most sophisticated and detailed. Uh, and originally, acupuncture was designed to treat patients who were extremely ill. It was not for tennis elbow and stress. It was for coughing up blood, if, you know, uh, cancer, heart disease, malaria, tuberculosis, and it was the main treatment that would be used for if hospitalized patients. <clears throat> so if you reach the level of being in the hospital, acupuncture was you know, probably the main therapy uh, for that. And that's pretty much lost. Um, so um, <clears throat> that's one, of, and it works very extremely well for that, I have to say. That's one of the reasons I travel around and speak about it, because time and time, because I'm a physician, I work in the hospital and can, can do that. And it works extremely well. So at this phase, what we're trying to do is to research that and validate my, or not validate my findings, as the case may be. <clears throat> OK, so the Warring States period in China is when most of the philosophical ideas from this um, occurred. And it was, a, it was a couple hundred years of you know, just terrible bloodshed. 20,000 people killed in a day, 40,000 people, countries demolished. But at the same time, it was this time of philosophical flourishing. It was called the Hundred Schools, so the flourishing of the Hundred Schools. And so Lao Tzu, Confucius, so those people lived in this time. And it was, it was a seminal time that seemed to be mirrored with different parts of the world, also in Greece, but, um, in a similar way, where they, there was a transition between empirical ways of thinking about the world and superstitious ways or thinking about deities and you know uh, ancestors and so forth. That's still part of Chinese medicine, by the way. But they, they shifted to making a theoretical system that was based on observations of nature, and particularly space-time patterns. So they were very acute observers of space-time patterns. And particularly up here in the state of Qi, up there, <coughs> that's where Confucius came from, and in this town called Linza, you see up there, um, there was an academy, uh, kind of like the Lyceum um, in Alexandria or in Greece, um, where people gathered to talk about these theories. And the naturalist school at that, at that school, is called the Jisha Gate Academy, was probably one of the main proponents of, of the Chinese medicine theory. And the naturalist school uh, looked, was the main school that was looking at patterns and then extrapolating theories. The Qin dynasty, the Qin um, <clears throat> over on the left side were very warlike. They ended up winning, which is why China is called China. It's called, uh, that's how China gets its name. Um, they only lasted about 20 years. And particularly for us, the important thing is there's that little arrow right here <clears throat> and those Chinese characters that say, Fan Chu <clears throat> Kung Ru. So it says, let's burn, roast the books, and and put the scholars in a hole, basically. So he was very, uh, the Qin Emperor was very militaristic, and he basically burned all of the books from the previous time, except for some books on medicine and agriculture, and he put the scholars in a pit and buried them. So that, that was a huge cultural loss to the world. That was probably 90% of uh, all of the, um, all of the very rich information that came before that. Uh, and so immediately, right away, we have to see that Chinese medicine comes out of the starting block stumbling because all of the, the theories that came with it. You would think that um, you know it got, it, things have gotten better over time, but they really took a heavy hit at the very beginning. And so even right away in the Han Dynasty, which followed, they, they didn't know how to interpret the text. They didn't know how to read the classics. The first dictionary of that time was um, Shou Wen Jaita was a book written to try and understand what the people had said before them in the Golden Age, because uh, they didn't understand it. So right away, they had lost a lot of the medicine. And frankly, in terms of acupuncture particularly, they never quite got it back. They got other things. They, they, they developed point action schools and mutilating techniques. But this original part, they never quite got it back. <clears throat> okay. And I just wanted to throw this up here. To show you the detail of these people, this was 2,200 years ago, 
And they did autopsies, and they looked at bodies, and they cut people open. They, they tried to measure um, blood vessels, particularly, and organs, and weights, and clothes. And here's a passage. The pancreas, which actually in Chinese medicine, if you're in Chinese medicine, you'll know the character P means spleen, but it was pretty clearly the pancreas. And that got mistranslated later as the spleen. And that there was probably two livers, because the body was mirrored on both sides in the original descriptions. So the pancreas. <clears throat> Think of this level of detail. The pancreas and the stomach are joined at their sides by a membrane. <clears throat> they, commun they communicate through a membrane. Excuse me. This needs a little work. Can you tell me about the circulation of the thick and the fluid metabolism? And he, then he goes off to say um, about the circulation of fluids and how it goes through the stomach. But if you know your anatomy, you know that the pancreas is actually a retroperitoneal membrane, it, it, organ, excuse me, to the stomach. It's part, partially retroperitoneal. So here are these people 2,200 years ago, and they're talking about this level of anatomy, which is kind of <clears throat> mind-blowing, actually, if you think about it. Here's a, here's a passage that says, this is relating to impairments of the pancreas, and it says, tie in, which is another way of talking about the pancreas or the spleen in Chinese medicine. It says, when it's impaired, the, the granaries of the body can no longer transport the nutrients into the metabolic pathways, basically, is what this is saying. And so think about the disease of type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome. Another place that says when this happens, the abdomen swells up like, you know, gets fat. And they're saying, you know, that the, the, you eat the food, it goes into the granaries of the body, which is your fat, basically. And it can't go into the metabolic pathways. I mean, that's kind of mind-blowing for 2,200 years ago. That's the level of detail that you see in these texts when you actually look. Um, here's another one. <clears throat> they're talking about vascular pathways. Uh, what are now acupuncture channels, or originally they were describing blood flow. Um, they had another, they also described fascial circulation, which is more, more akin to what modern acupuncture does, with fascial activation. Um, and they described the pathways of those things too, but they were primarily concerned with blood flow uh, for a long variety of reasons, which I won't go into. But think about this detail of anatomy. Here they're talking about the palmar arch branch. It's called the branch tributary or the VA. It's now called the low point or the low uh, channel. And it has this name called column opening or however we. It says it arrives, rises behind the wrist <clears throat> and moves along the lung fascial plane. And it spreads into the center of the palm. And it goes up to this thing called the fish border, which is your thenar eminence. And you're looking at this picture, and it's like exactly what they're describing. If you look at that palmar arch, it's splitting behind the wrist, it's wrapping around the, the palm, and it's going up the femur, femur eminence there. That's the level of anatomy that is, like, was unheard of until the last, you know, the, the very recent path. Yes? And did they do the sections, autopsies? They did. <clears throat> yes, they did do that. And you just have to imagine they're also in an agrarian society where they're cutting animals open every day, and they're, they're doing battlefield medicine where people come in and they're like played open. And the Chinese have no problem cutting people up, but they'll just, you know, uh, if they want to. <clears throat> now, that's kind of incredible that they could describe that system. Uh, because, you know, until the 17th century, so we thought blood you know, was circulated by the liver. That's where, that's where we were. Uh, but here's what they say about it. In this little path of circulation in the hand, when there's excess blood flow, in this palmar arch, the symptoms are heat near the radial styloid and in the palm. And if there's deficient flow in this palmar arch, the person will be yawning and have frequent urinary incontinence. Now just think about that for a second, that someone was looking at this part of your blood circulation, and they were watching it to see <clears throat> when it's empty, it's like this. When it's full, it's like that. I mean, that, that is kind of something that goes way beyond uh, you know, what we know today. Uh, you might say, well, that's probably ridiculous, and uh, you know, perhaps it, it is, except I can tell you it usually isn't. It's usually very accurate. Um, so they're talking about how blood circulation works in different parts of your body and all the different symptoms and all the different levels, like if it's in your skin or in your liver or in your brain. Uh, and they're giving you acupuncture techniques where a, a list of ways of regulating the body's tissue planes to restore specific vascular flow to particular areas in targeted ways. 
And it turns out that that's a very, very powerful tool in medicine. And if you've ever seen a surgery, has anybody ever been in a developmental surgery or? Yeah, Gordon has. And <clears throat> if you've ever seen a non-perfused organ or limb, and you, you see someone do the bypass and they implant the bypass, and then you watch the organ and you see this flood of, it's purple and dark, and then you know whew, you see this thing kind of go, go across, and you see it turn red and pink and it starts beating normally, and you go, that's not, they weren't so far off actually to, to kind of focus on that. And so here's like an angiogram of the hand, and you can just imagine someone staring there, knowing it's anatomy number one, 2,000 years ago, and knowing when it's full and empty. Those are just two descriptors. They also say like when the flow is turbulent, when, when cold things go, and they give lots of symptoms for these things. It's kind of, it's kind of incredible. Um, shifting gears. <clears throat> I kind of have to say this in every talk I give because um, the concept that there are more than two sciences is a very strange one to, for us you know, in Western science. That there could be more than one legitimate science, for example, one way of looking at the world because our science is pretty new and we, it's a nice, well, we're pretty attached to it and so forth. So the idea that there's an entirely different science with a different set of principles is kind of is strange. But unless you know that, you, you can't even open the door to this topic. So um, this is what I came up when I thought about science. Maybe you guys can add some. But I thought, well, what is a science? And a science has to be, it has to be uh, consistent with observable phenomena in the world. You can't say, I have a science, and it's about how birds fly backwards, and you know, uh, turtles fly up into the sky, you know, and rocks fall down when it rains. You know, it just doesn't work. And science has to have a theoretical concept, a framework. So the observations have to fit in a framework. And because otherwise, it's empiricism. You know, uh, and it must be have possess, possess consistent predictive power. I mean, it has to work. You have to be able to repeat it and say it didn't work on Tuesday, but it worked on Thursday. And in each of those cases, maybe you guys know other ones, but those are my three. The Neal criteria, you heard it here. Um, those are my three, and uh, both Chinese ancient science and Western modern science fit those criteria. And this is really important for the Chinese medicine practitioners because what you see in the Chinese medicine world, particularly in the West, but also in China, is that they hope to give over their science to Western science and ask for validation from Western science. And I can tell you that Western science actually very much needs the insights of ancient science. So <clears throat> my, my uh, recommendation is to stand your ground, people. <laughs> okay, don't let, don't let Gordon steamroll you, or the Western doctor steamroll you. We'll get up on him. And, uh, so, but they're based on very different assumptions. <clears throat> Ancient science says what, be, what came first is valuable. Modern science says what is being discovered today, and it's in Newsweek, today is valuable. What happened 20 years ago is like in the recycling bin. Um, so there's this character Chen, which means to look backwards and to the future. It means, in Chinese, it means when you look to <clears throat> what's important, you look backwards. And um, this third one is a huge one. This is probably the biggest one. Chinese medicine sees the world as a place of continual change and transformation. And so they study the science of change and transformation. That's why I said that Beijing is a, is a space-time manual. Uh, and as a matter of fact, and uh, Western science, and you know, in contrast, is looking for those places, the Cartesian model, we're looking for those places in the fog of consciousness or the fog of experience that we can put our hat on and say, this thing is unchanging and it's going to be there always the same. And guess what that's called in Chinese uh, philosophy or Chinese medicine? A place that never changes and is always the same, that's the definition of an illness. <clears throat> Okay, but two different ways of looking at it, two different sets. Um, <clears throat> so in classical science, we're looking at the space-time patterns behind form. So form is an expression of patterning, but it's kind of like an afterthought. So we're actually much more concerned about the patterning, because if you understand the patterning, you understand the form, and the body is part of the form, uh, versus Western medicine or Western science, which is really concerned with the form of things. And you know, if you've ever been to the doctor, and if you don't, if you have a symptom and there's not a thing attached to it, um, you're in deep trouble. <clears throat> you're headed for antidepressants pretty quickly, <laughs> um, because we need to see things that are on lab tests or on MRI scans, and if they're not, they just don't exist. 
And for us, you know, if it's, when it's on an MRI scan, that's because you've been asleep at the switch for so long that the patterning is now turned into a thing. And that's like way down the road. Um, they use a different language system and they're reducing complexity to simplicity. Um, we won't go into those. And contemporary science is just kind of the opposite. And particularly this thing about that they're trying to see things that are fixed and unchanging. Two separate scientific systems with scientific validity with deep cultural divisions. <clears throat> so until you have that conversation between people who are doing research, the research just doesn't even get off the ground in a certain way. Like as a Chinese medicine person, when I look at the Western research, I go, this doesn't really have much to do with anything. I mean, a lot of it. Um, it's not that we don't find interesting things, but you don't make that, you can't start actually working with the other system until you understand the assumptions upon which the other system is based. Um, we're actually, with our institute, we're actually trying to bridge that because there is a way of bridging it. And actually phase one of Chinese medicine is intensely biomedical. It, you know, it actually, TCM has a problem with talking to Western medicine because it's talking about kind of invisible channels and things about energy um, that Western people just don't get. And when they cut people open, they don't see those things. Those are in fascial planes, by the way. And as fascial science improves, you will see that, that understanding get better. But um, um, if you're looking at blood circulation, that is very biomedical. You can measure that with a thermographic imaging camera. You can watch diseases change blood flow states. There's all sorts of very concrete things you can do once you understand what they're originally talking about. So that's a very promising area for you that's been untapped so far. Um, I'm going to just skip through this. OK, here's the big one. This is, the, as far as I'm concerned, this is the elephant in the room of Western bioscience research, or Western science in general. And, and there are some very, like Nigel and other people who do actually research and know more than I do about this. And Gordon, um, please correct me uh, on this or give your input. But to me, when I, when, coming from the Chinese point of view, where I look at how well they describe complexity and change, and I look at Western medicine, and I see there's always like this uh, block that you get up to. And if you can't model complexity and change, you're describing the world in a very limited way. Um, and so, uh, like, <clears throat> and the answer is not to get another computer uh, or to, you know, to um, and do more math on it. It's to change the way you see the world. So the difference in the Chinese way is that they came up with a unified field theory right away. Uh, and because of that, they can model change and complexity. Uh, versus uh, in our system where we're trying to kind of nail down different details, but we don't really know how to put them together. Take the human genome as an example. You know, what's interesting about the human genome? Uh, it's the great greatest new thing since sliced bread. You know, we know what's going on. In the, you never hear the most interesting thing about the human genome, which is how does the human genome know to turn on and off all of the human genome in a way that looks like this slide <clears throat> over a given day, over a person's lifetime, what is the intelligence that turns that system on and off and regulates it? We have no clue. So, I jump in if I'm wrong. I haven't been in the scientific world for a while. But uh, it's that, and if you want to do that, you know, adding another computer would not get you there. Because if you look at this cloud, this is the way nature looks. This is the way the body looks. Uh, but what would this picture look like in five minutes? And how would you predict that? How many supercomputers would you need? Well, you can't have that many supercomputers, and you'd probably be wrong. Uh, but if you know that there's a, there's a unified field theory, um, you can predict, you can watch how things change and follow them and understand what's happening. What is the unified field theory of Chinese medicine, their observation that kind of got it right from the very beginning, as far as I can tell? And it's, you probably heard this from me before, but it's that the universe at its most essential level is a breath or an expansion and contraction cycle. So that <clears throat> the expansion, contraction, the expansion phase is called yang and the contraction phase is called yin. And those are kind of the deepest uh, definitions of yin and yang. So yang, yin, yang, yin, yang, yin. But it's not just one cycle, it's an infinite amount of cycles, space-time expansion and contraction cycles that are fractally inscribed upon each other. And so it's the composite of all the cycles that are happening together at once 
that gives rise to the phenomena that we see in the world. But how powerful is this as a doctor? <clears throat> um, let me just jump ahead here to, um, oh, here's what Albert Einstein said. He was talking about this thing. Uh, he was saying, when the fact is coming into play in anything in nature, phenomenological complex is too large, the scientific method fails. Well, guess what? That's, that's our life. That's the complexity of our bodies. <clears throat> One need only think about the weather, in which case the prediction, even for a few days, is impossible. No one doubts that we are confronted with a causal connection whose, whose components are known to us, yet this is outside of our domain. Because you can't predict this because of the variety of factors in operation, not because you don't need, because of a lack of ordering. Uh, so <clears throat> the same thing is true in the body. If someone has cancer, for example, and you're treating them, how does that body put itself back together so that it's non-cancering. You know, it's not a matter that you know the right acupuncture point or you're really good at knitting and you knit the body back into place. Um, we rely on the body's inherent intelligence to solve the problem for us. And we go around and just look for these big places where it's not working very well. And we clear that up so the body, which can deal with change and complexity very well, will go back and reform itself. Um, I won't go into this. <clears throat> This just shows if you have a basic Chinese formula, very simple, and you start looking at the active ingredients, which are all like drugs, and you add them all up. I mean, here's a very basic formula. There's 116 active drugs in that formula. So how are you possibly going to research that formula with 116 variables? Would you ever do that in a scientific research with medications? No, and you wouldn't be able to. But with the traditional uh, theories of Chinese medicine and language, it allows you to make sense of this degree of complexity. It's a wonderful thing that way. Um, okay, so the universe is the breath, or it's called, it expands, it's called yang, it contracts, it's called yin. The fabric of that breath is called qi. It's actually very, this is very straightforward. <clears throat> the universe is made up of a number, an infinite number, down from the cell, cellular level, where it's pulsing to the universe, which is expanding and probably contracting, I don't know. Um, and very simple things. If you're moving with this, it's called flow in the classics. If you're moving against this, it's called counterflow. This is like kindergarten. Uh, if you move with it, you're healthy. If you move against it, you're not. Sounds deceptively simple. But guess what? If I go into the ICU and I'm dealing with a patient who has um, diabetes, sepsis, two hospital nosocomial infections, cardiovascular disease, renal insufficiency, um, you know, and an ulcer. Do I want something that's highly complicated or do I want something that's very simple? I want something that's extremely simple because it's already complicated. What do you normally see in the hospital? You see that there's an infectious disease team, there's a cardiac team, there's a gastroenterology team, there's this team, there's that team, there's this team, and it turns into this complicated situation. But what I really want is something that says, you know, the sun comes up, and the sun goes down, and the world breathes in, and the world breathes out. <clears throat> that helps me quite a bit as a physician. Where the body cannot move with these patterns, it's called an illness. Not very complicated. Anything that restores the body's ability to resonate and move with these motions is called a treatment. There's only two kinds of pathologies. Treatment of contraction and treatment of pathology of it of contraction and pathology of expansion. Those tools are like extremely powerful in complex situations. Um, this is one place where the more modern version, the TCM version, does have trouble because it's a pattern-based recognition system. So that if you actually do have the pattern of TCM, a certain symptom complex, pulse, tongue, it works extremely well. But as soon as it starts to veer off or become this thing where there's six rounding teams, it becomes almost impossible. <clears throat> okay, and so here's these beautiful vessels, and if you're a Chinese medicine person, you know what's the first, the first point or the first region on an extremity is called the Jing Well Point. It's like they, they gave it images of how water flows off for the points moving through the extremities, and they said at the first one down by the fingers, it's like a well, where the water's kind of welling up out of the soil or going back into the soil. And if you look at this angiogram, you see that. It actually looks like that, what you're talking about. And then as it gets bigger, the water flow is getting bigger and bigger, and they say it's like a little stream and then a big stream and so forth, and um, so forth. 
So here, for example, is a good um, picture of like, this is the name of what is now called the lung channel, which is found on the outside of the arm. And originally, the lung channel was really clearly the lung blood vessel. And the lung blood vessel was very clearly the axillary artery and the brachial artery and the radial artery. So uh, one of the problems that's happened over time, over the dynasties, because there was confusion about these things right out of the box, is that lots of the pathways got moved. So that originally they did have an anatomical basis, but now they're, they're in different places. And so when people look at them, they say, this has nothing to do with the blood vessel system because it's not where the blood vessels are, but that's because most of them got moved, <clears throat> or a lot of them got moved, not all of them. Yes? So do you feel that, or did they, did they use pattern recognition? I'm confused. Did they, do you advocate pattern recognition? I, yeah, I'm a doctor, and I'm, I advocate um, whatever works. <clears throat> uh, we've been just having this discussion on a forum, because people you can get very precious, you know, but like if you're really taking care of sick people, you want what works. If it works, it works. And does TCM work? Yes, it does work. It's actually a distillation of very, very smart uh, physicians for people who not, were not very experienced with Chinese medicine. That was pretty much how it evolved as a descriptive course for people who didn't know that much from people who were very smart and they boiled it down. Would you want that book? Absolutely, you want that book. And also, it, it's based, the acupuncture particularly is based more on fascial based acupuncture which was also the experience of very good physicians about when you put in this point in the fascial body, these are the kinds of things we see happening. And would you want that experience? Of course you want that experience. It's extremely valuable. <clears throat> but it's a different kind of system. So you want to be able to think independently and critically, but at the same time, you want to know what others have thought, how they saw it, how they interpreted the pattern. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really just a matter of direction of study. If you, because we, we, we received the fruits of this in the West, but we, don't, we didn't know about the roots. So if you start at the tip of a tree and you try and understand the tree backwards, it's very hard to understand a tree from a leaf. But if you understand how trees grow and what a root system is, then you understand what a leaf is. So actually, if you look at most researchers, they're starting in modern times and they're slowly going backwards. But they should be starting in, you know, in the very first times and working this way. And if our curriculum was based on that, that would make much more sense. It makes much more sense if you know the root foundations, and then you learn that in the main dynasty there was a doctor who did it this way, and then there was somebody who did this way. Then you just, you're putting it on a tree. Uh, and unfortunately, I know, um, yeah, I've been an educator too in TCM, and the problem is now that the accreditation for what you have to do uh, and TCM is so locked in that you have very little very wiggle. Yeah, you have like 5% wiggle room. So, but if you could really just change the curriculum, it would be like so much better. Uh, but it's, that would be like a just percolating. Post-grad work. Yeah, and, and then it's hard because then you're kind of trying to re-educate backwards. It's very, very tough. Anyway, I have sympathy for you guys. <laughs> uh, so here's what these uh, acupuncture needles, the descriptions of them look like actually. And they're surgical tools that regulate different tissue planes of the body for targeted reflow of vascular flow. I should say also that Nanjing did have uh, fascial-based acupuncture. They also, they had the whole ball of wax. They, they talked about that every tissue plane in your body has a rhythm and they're different rhythms, they have different diseases. So when you want to needle the bones, do it this way. When you want to needle the tendons, do it this way. When you want to needle the skin, do it this way. When you want to needle the fat, do it this way. When you want to make the collateral blood circulation improve, use these techniques. When you want the longitudinal flow, use these techniques. So it was a very, it was a much more sophisticated system. Whereas now in acupuncture, there's a fascial based point prescription for all those different regions, which originally had different techniques. <clears throat> okay, so here, for example, they talked about the, the, the Mobiren. And this is another one that gives you kind of shivers down your spine. Uh, if you cut open a body and you look at the fascial structures of the body, it's not apparent, it's not immediately apparent to you that that is one sheet of fascia. Because like if you if you can if you cut open a muscle, you'll see the fascia around the muscle if you buy a chicken tonight and cook it for dinner, you'll see the fascia, that thing, gleaming, gleaming stuff. Um, if you cut open a muscle, you'll see the fascia around the, the bands. If you look at the abdomen, you'll see the fascial compartments in there. But it doesn't look like it's from one membrane. But embryologically, it is one membrane that's been imaginated in multiple ways 
to look like these in, in, uh, separate wrappings. But they kind of got that right from the beginning by calling it the, the MOUN, or the source membrane. They said, <clears throat> from the same system as the tendons, that system came this source membrane, which wraps around things and provides structural support. And <clears throat> so these things that are called channels um, are <clears throat> the fascial grooving patterns. You have shown this so much as Helene mentioning. Um, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, her work. Oh, is she? She's, a, she's a physiologist, fascial. Oh, yeah. She's talking, and she, her, her research for probably 10, the 10 years goes into this and yes. demonstrated the findings of the fascial tissue. Would you send me that? Yeah. Absolutely. When, when, you look at, when you look at the people doing fascial research, it's so exciting. And you know, the problem for acupuncture in the West has been how does something happen non-locally and instantaneously? So like why, you know, for Western science it makes no sense that you would put a needle in your little toe and that the blood flow in your visual cortex would improve instantaneously. Um, that's been a big stumbling block for people. But if you think about it, it's a fascial-based system and everything's wrapped in this fascia and it's all under tension in a very complex way. And if you intervene at certain points, and then somewhere in a distant part, it releases your shoulder. Um, that's pretty much the basis for uh, fascial-based point acupuncture, which has its own science. Um, <clears throat> it's just in the old days they had all this stuff, and now we just have we have um, we have a part of it, a good part of it. <clears throat> okay, so here we are. It's a kind of surgery. It's restoring the blood flow, and I think that's that was all my slides because um, I wanted to keep it at 45 minutes. Um, but what part of what I said is not clear? What are, what are your questions? And um, I know the article was kind of long and um, complex and nervous thought, but yeah. Um, it seems that what you're saying is when connections between traditional anti medicine and biomedicine are made, that you use classical texts such as in aging as the basis of those uh, parallels that you draw, which with your vocabulary that Crosses both realms. You That's right, I'm your super doctor, so I still heard. One of the points that Dr. Sonia Pinsker makes, and I think it's an article, is that um, one of the biggest leaps at um, schools of East Asian medicine is when teachers kind of um, riff and draw these parallels without knowing the classic text as right. well. I think there's more diversity in those opinions than, you know, because yeah. they're not. This is, a, this is an interesting uh, thing. Um, I'll just tell you a story about that. When I first started, I was an internist, and this was back in the mid-90s, early 90s. And I started, I went to the doctor's training course in acupuncture, and I had a great time, you know, a 300 hour course, and I came back, and, and someone gave me, uh, an herb company gave us a bunch of herbs for our, our clinic, because it was not a nonprofit. So in a handbook, so I started like, reading the book in the room, and started handing out the herbs, you know. And it worked. It was pretty good, and uh, then I started to try and mix Western medicine and Chinese medicine. So I'd see an article in a Chinese journal, and it would say, this substance actually treats type 2 diabetes in a rat. And so i say, okay, well, you got diabetes, so let's add this thing that worked in a rat. And universally, not very helpful. Um, what was really helpful was to use the traditional way of diagnosis, not mix up the systems, when you're using, does it mean that I forget how to be a doctor? No. It's very strange. People like have this fear that if I embrace one system, I'll forget how to tie my shoe in the other system. As if someone came in and they were having engine and I forgot how to call 911. You know, it just doesn't happen that way. So you, can, you can't handle two systems simultaneously. But at a certain point, I realized I had to go cold turkey off of Western science because it was like laying down new brain pathways. And you can't do that at the same way you're, like you're doing both at the same. So for eight years, I didn't read a journal. I didn't, you know, get my CMEs. Gordon, don't listen to this. I, you know, um, I went to China. I learned the language better. I translated, and I didn't touch Western medicine at all. I spent a lot of time over in China. And it was only after working with an aging and finding, understanding the space-time patterning, that in the last couple of years, I've come back to Western medicine. And now, Western medicine is immensely powerful because I, can, because I can look at an MRI scan or a blood test or a congenital disorder as a problem of space-time patterning. 
and it's really powerful. You can, and it just goes, there's no problem between the West and the Chinese part. Um, there's this other issue, which is about the rich tapestry of Chinese medicine. You hear that phrase a lot. And which means there's lots of different schools, which is great on one hand, but it also, I think, at times is a, a symptom that our topsoil is not very deep. So like, if you, if you really have a deep root, um, something very um, robust is growing. But especially you, here in the West. Especially here in the West, mm -hmm. exactly. But if you don't have good topsoil, what happens? Your plants, they kind of grow up and then they fall over. So when you see Chinese medicine continuing education, you see these people, especially if they graduate, they, they've gone to this workshop, and I'm like 20% this person, and I'm 30% that person, and I do ear acupuncture, and I'm like this, and then I use um, aromatherapy. And then you look at that person and you go, well, maybe the top soil is not so deep. That's a great analogy. <laughs> so sometimes when you hear rich fabric of Chinese medicine, that is true, and it can be not true, too. It is true, there's lots of lineages which are very, have a lot of experience, too. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, how would you rate the effectiveness of TCM? The effectiveness? Yeah. I, you know, I've had incredible um, results with TCM, when I, and frankly, when I didn't know anything, when I was starting and I had, you know, the book and I was with the patient and they had these symptoms and I was matching them up and then I said, well, take that and they'd come back and I'd go, wow, does that work really? Well, I think it's dependent on what you can find too and what they're really coming in for. You know, you can apply TCM to some conditions that maybe you can't apply as well with other schools. Yeah. If they just have a different diagnostic paradigm for different patients. And, and particularly, like, if a, per if a person, like, it's called the Njalunger, which means discriminate a pattern, prescribe a treatment. That's the basis of TCM. It means that they're, because they were boiling it down for people who didn't understand the classics or the theories much. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, <clears throat> these old doctors said, okay, so like, if the person's coughing, you know, and it's white, and their tongue has a yellow coat, and their pulse is wiry, then you give this formula and put in these points. If the person has diarrhea, and it's watery, and they have cramping gas, and the pulse is this, and the tongue is that. So, if you see that person, TCM usually hits it out of the ballpark. But here's the problem. The person comes back and they say, that was great. 70% of the things got better, but then my right shoulder started to tingle and, you know, every time I peed, I got dizzy or something like that. And you're like, huh? Because you don't really, it's because now they're not that pattern. Mm -hmm. Or for example, like, you know, the person in the ICU with the six rounding teams. Um, that's just a non-starter because there's so many there's there's so many syndromes there. Um, and you have to have something much more sophisticated to deal with that person. The chronic conditions and Yeah, you know if you fit the pattern, mm -hmm. usually it's pretty good. So Zeph speaks a lot about this pattern transmutation which a lot of students you know struggle with in the context of pattern differentiation. And in the West, yes. So we teach, you know, pattern differentiation, and that's our school of thought. Most of the schools looking at Bob to get confirmation on this. Well, not only in the West. Well, I mean, you yeah. have, you have well, to. Well, I write not only in the West. You have to teach it so that people can pass their exams. Yes. Right, but then even understanding how a pattern might transmute into something else, and what would be yeah. the paths? What are the algorithms? If right. we're going to be forced into this box. Right. And when you go to China and you see the good doctors mm -hmm. in the hospital doing TCM, that's what they're doing. That's they know doing. about pattern transmutation. Right. They know how to treat four patterns at once. Mm -hmm. They know how it's moving from one thing to the other. Um, and that's usually about the skill level of most people nice. in the West. So what? So no top soil. No, <laughs> no top soil and um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? But we get this question from a lot of students. You know, um, is TCM effective? Isn't this over here more effective? Well, well, it depends. That actually wasn't my question because TCM is effective. I mean, I've been using TCM, on, I've had it used on me for 20 years. Yeah, it so works. it's effective, but I was just interested it's, in it. You know, in general, you will not find a TCM person when you're going into a hospital like to treat someone who's on their third cancer or you know, chemotherapy. Or, right, except, or except for like to treat their nausea from chemotherapy or something, yeah. but not to treat the tumor. Right, and, and that's, that's yeah. not to treat malaria, not to treat those things, and that's that's why that's why I spend my time traveling around and talking because, you know, um, <clears throat> if you start thinking about the implication of this, it's kind of mind-boggling. Um, this is this is a medicine that's portable; it doesn't 
cost anything. There's no diagnostic equipment. It was originally designed for the people who were most sick in the world. I mean, routinely in our clinic, I, I, I see people who have spent, you know, $200,000, $400,000 on a medical treatment, and I look back at the treatment that we gave them that actually fixed the problem sometimes, not always, and it's something like $25 worth of supplies. You know, and here's another thing, even if, you know, Western medicine, by the way, does not have to go away, because it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Um, but imagine, right now, it, <clears throat> when you see the way the, the um, maybe it's changed since I was on my, so well, my walkabout, but um, the, when I was in training, the view of the body was very passive. Like, we asked nothing of the body. We did things to the body. The body was like a test tube in which things were going up and down, and, but the patient's basically lying on bed, watching TV, you know, and eating pudding. We don't actually ask anything of the body. But it turns out when we ask things of the body, the body can do a huge amount. Um, so when you optimize its functioning and do things according to traditional principles, for every disease in the hospital, there's a potential for like, you know, significantly changing the outcome by big numbers, you know, 20, 60 percent, something like that would be my guess, at least. Whereas in Western science, if a drug goes from being 2 percent effective to 4 percent effective, that's on the New York Times, you know? <clears throat> just a simple thing, I was using a poultice this morning on a patient, I use it on my mom, she falls over and breaks her bones all the time these days, because she had polio, and it's just a simple poultice, and routinely it, it increases the healing time of bone fractures by 50%, and she keeps going back to her doctor and saying, and her doctor says, well, did we get the right x-ray here, Bay? You know. And she, he said, how did your bones, you're like 90 years old, how did your bones heal in two weeks? And she said, oh, you know, my son, he's a Chinese medicine doctor, and he got these herbs and rolled them in a pot, and then by that point he's like, ah, oh, whatever. <clears throat> you know, crazy old lady. <laughs> but, I mean, think about if there was a pill that increased fracture healing by 50%. That would be on the New York Times tomorrow. That herb uh, poultice that I used today costs $6 for four days of treatment. That's, that's, and what's the herb? It, it's like, it's like, it's just a mix of, um, you know, uh, trauma herbs, fracture herbs, the Lulu tongue, those kinds of things, um, Don Gray, you know, San Chi, those kinds of things. Very, very, very basic poultice. Um, there's just like this huge potential to make huge differences. And especially as we look at healthcare kind of driving off a cliff under the weight of its own um, finances. Um, you know, I have a big interest in using this in, in, in countries where they don't have access to health care, and also in the U.S., in places where they don't have access to health care. In international places, there's lots of places where there's training physicians and nurses, and they're sitting in a hospital and they have no supplies. That's really common. So what would it be like if we went there and trained these people for six months on how to do this? You know, and I literally, I was saying at lunch, in my backpack, I could load this up with enough needles to treat a hospital, a full-time hospital practice for six months. Mm -hmm. And the cost would be $100. <clears throat> Probably the needle company would donate the needles. Um, you know, it's just ridiculous. Well, at least a road that we can is kind of important is really trying to do this right oh, again. Mm -hmm. in the U.S. So yeah. we may be seeing this more. Just yeah. trying to start trying to start school, too. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, I'm really excited to, uh, I'm, a mix, I'm very excited right now to be working, uh, hopefully working with, with biomedical institutions, maybe UCSD, because there's just like so many good studies to be done. And, um, yes? Yeah, thank you. I, number one, I read these articles, I thought they were great. And, and um, one of the things I really enjoyed was the, the historical accuracy, and, you know, that it was really evidence-based and fact-based. And, and then I get to the conclusion, and, and, and I'm, I'm trying to process this for myself and for our school, for our students, for our field, whatever. Because I think our students struggle with, like, TCM is effective. TCM is learnable. One can create a curriculum that can be traversed in, you know, a fixed period of time. Uh, you've obviously quoted Kim Taylor's work on 
you know, what's happened in, in modern China post Mao and, and why, and, and even what's happened in China maybe even prior to Mao with the Nationalist Party trying to essentially eliminate the native practice of medicine from China. You know, luckily they didn't succeed, you know, came pretty close in 1929, etc. as part of their modernization agenda. But I guess, when, and what I struggle with my, with my students is, okay, this happened in 1949, it's happened in China, there's been this change, but when I was in conversation with Giovanni Machocha in the class last week, we Skyped him in and asked him this question, and you know, he, his view is that it hasn't been a negative thing necessarily, the systematization that happened as a result of that, the making it more learnable and accessible and increasing the spread of Chinese medicine throughout the world. You know, so I'm trying to sort of hold those two thoughts of valuing the, because I do and always have in my work and have taught that way and, and a translator myself and have been to China several times. And, you know, appreciating that rich tradition, going back to classic text as much as we can to clarify things, but at the same time, accepting, embracing progress, embracing the changes that happen that do seem to be effective, and kind of holding those two thoughts together and proceeding that way. I think a lot of our students hear like they might access your work and then presume that what we're teaching them is crap. And I would, that would be instead. That, yeah. that would not be my goal. And I think it behooves, and I feel a responsibility in my work to point out to students that, that no, it doesn't have to be interpreted that way. Mm. And, and so I got please, to the- Please pass that on for me to your students. Because I, <laughs> I felt that, and I could have been projecting, because I, that, you know, I, that was I, the conclusion you were drawing from all this great historical- uh, and you know, To me, it's just, it's just a treat, you know? And do you know the roots and then know the branches, or do you just know the branches? You know, and are, are, you know, the Tao Jing addresses this like in the first chapter, like which is better, the unseen, creative, mystical source of the universe, or like the pomegranate, you know, the thing that it produces? And the answer is, they are the same thing. They come from the they come from the same thing place, and they have different names, and neither of them are better. Um, which is better, the fruit of a tree or the root of a tree? It's not even a question. It's a tree, <clears throat> but if you only if you only gather flowers, what's the nice thing about flowers? You know, when TCM came to the West, it was like a bouquet of flowers. It was like this wonderful thing, and the good thing about TCM, like this is hard to learn. Mm -hmm. It's really, I mean, all the pathways and the symptoms and the techniques. You're, this is doctor level in terms of hours mm -hmm. training. It's not, it's not unlike medical school. But what's great about TCM is you can. You can hand this off to someone pretty quickly and say, "Go forth and use this." Um, but what's the what's the bad thing about flowers? So there was this beautiful thing that came to the West. But what's the bad thing about flowers? Is they go bad in about a week, you know, three days, and then you have to buy new flowers. So it's <clears throat> if you it's to me it's all just a matter of like uh, which way you look at it. If you look from the roots up, it's all good. If you look at it from the leaves down, it's confusing. Um, yeah, but I agree with you, and I, I, I hope I don't come off this way. No, you, you don't. Um, others do. But know. this, because I've I'm, actually... I'm really happy that you don't. I mean, it's great. I, most people in this field, and I think it's this, I think it, you know, maybe it's their temperament, but also people who are studying classical, the classical sources tend to be like, uh, that's really nonsense, and this is the only thing, and I'm only going to do this from this, and um, I think that's not, actually, that's not my position. But I do, <laughs> I do understand where it comes from a little bit because if you work in this field, it's kind of like you're in. It's like it's there's this whole world around you, and you feel like you have to like make a lot of noise because no one's looking over here. I know in that article, particularly, I was trying to like take, say a few provocative things, just because I wanted people to say what's going on over there, and like get wow or whatever, or at least start to have a conversation. So that might have come out in the article a little bit. But it's not actually, yeah. I want results. We got results. We're on the same team. Yeah, I think this approach um, is sort of mutually respectful and also, I mean, I think it's the right way to go, basically, because it enables 
the field to communicate yeah. one, one, one side of the field, if you will, to the other. And it allows people to embrace classical and modern mm -hmm. knowledge and not have to feel like they have to choose one yeah. or the other yeah. because classical is automatically better. Yes. Just yeah. out of hand. And it's like, well, not, not necessarily. A profession know. needs more of this type of dialogue within yeah. the different conferences that we have in order to yeah. elevate the discussion. Yeah. And I'm, I'm afraid to yeah, yeah. Yeah. and I, we see too many of the extremists that yeah. aren't able to really think with both Right, right, and you know, Chinese medicine is a strain. It's just, I'm not a, that's not my base culture. You know, I'm a Western medicine, so I'm kind of an outsider. And it's a, kind of, it is a, it is a hard, there's a lot of different opinions. Yes, and, um, <clears throat> but there's a lot of great insights. You know. But the, the this challenge our profession faces is that most of the people, uh, the practitioners they, uh, uh, developing these opinions, don't have the ability to translate them, some of right. them do, so, and go to the original source, yeah. and don't have the maturity in their critical right. thinking to have this discussion. But they follow the, the devotee thinking yeah. without being critical thinkers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we're faced as a profession of trying to clean this up right now, right. and so we need to elevate this discussion. Yeah. What do you think is the best way to do that, Steve? Well, stuff like this is really important. I mean, this is obviously a very small group of, of um, colleagues, but Edward uh, spoke at our conference last year, and I heard just some other colleagues and in the hallways what a breath of fresh air it was to have an objective um, uh, uh, scholar to come in and talk about this level of, um, of thinking without the emotional aspect of it, which we see so much around classical Chinese medicine, that term is loaded as it is in our profession. So I mean, trying to even get rid of that terminology, of which I love just your faces, I was like, ah, that's an interesting way to put it. I don't know if you saw that. Can you jump back to that slide as a matter of fact? Because when I saw that, I went, that could be used as a tool. So what did you think about that, Bob? I'm not sure. The, the one on the phases, like instead of calling it oh, classical yeah. Chinese medicine, talking about the oh. phases mm -hmm. of Chinese medicine is much more scholarly. And and it, yes, and it's not loaded. Mm -hmm. Like classical, this is the way to do it because this is classical versus, oh, you're TCM, so yeah. yes. <laughs> Boring states and country <laughs> I, I, but that was a great question. It's like how this is what I'm talking about with with my, my colleagues. It's like how do we elevate this dialogue to a scholarly debate so it's not so loaded and extremist? If I might, too, as an outsider and not you know being um, well versed in Chinese medicine, what I'm also hearing is they were developed for slightly different things. So they were they were they used were. for slightly yes, different things. Yes, they but a lot of our students and recent grads they don't get this. Yeah. They, they don't understand it. Those three hegemonists. Acupuncture. <laughs> yeah. I would say I would say one thing. Yes. I would say one thing that I do think that in, in the Chinese medicine field now, there's an epistemological crisis, which means that when you talk to people in you know in the field, in China or in the West, and you ask them like, what is a channel? What is Tai Yang? What are these basic terms? That nine times out of ten, people don't know the basic terms of the field. And for the classics argument, <clears throat> the, that's where those things are defined. So uh, they're not defined later. Um, and so in, in the articles, I made this point several times, and I usually do when I'm speaking, is that I'm a proponent of physician thinking. Mm -hmm. um, not for everybody, by the way. You know, in, in the Western healthcare model, not everybody's a neurosurgeon. And you know, there are different models of training and different models of intervention, and that's good. Maybe it's good to train a lot of people who can do things pretty quickly um, without a lot, without five years of reading and aging and so forth. But there is this thing about uh, that, what does it mean to be a physician? Not about licensing, but about thinking. And you know, what I come back to is that if you can deal with complexity through an understanding of principle, that's physician level thinking. If you, mm -hmm. if you are following protocol, that's Ancillary medicine thing. Yeah. Yes. However you call that. Yeah. Is mm -hmm. one better than the other? It's like the Dada Jing? Mm -hmm. No, they're both like mm -hmm. they're, they're both important. Yeah. But for example, what might this look like? Maybe in Chinese medicine you have it like Western medicine where when a person comes in, they are treated by the local GP or FNP, 
you know, in a clinic and they get certain treatments, and if it doesn't work, then they get referred up to people who may be studied for, you know, in different ways in whatever field, and so that they get funneled into the people who where it's where it's not working as well. That's the Western model. I don't know if that's a good one to use, but maybe we should also consider that. I don't know because not I can tell you not everybody is up to learning classical Chinese and. Yeah, what should we say? We need people out in the front lines. We do. We, we, need, need, yeah, yeah. we need that. But for me, it's also um, important uh, clinical honesty or you know, honesty about <laughs> efficacy. And I mean, unless you have evidence to the contrary, I feel pretty strongly that Western medicine has a much better record of results with infectious disease, <laughs> for example. And I mean, I'm a student. Uh, amateur student of medical history of, of all sorts and have read a lot about the history of infectious disease and you know although there were there were discussions and classical well not classical by this definition but you know 19th 18th century older literature 17th century even during the warm disease period where people were writing about plagues and other and even shanghaman arguably encountering typhoid fever but we don't really know how, at least I don't feel confident that I can, can, although those protocols exist, I don't know how effective those formulas and treatments were against bubonic plague, or I suspect not very, to be frank, even though I'm a practitioner and, you know, and dean of our college, but I, I feel it's important to put that on the table, which is- Yes, I would actually, I would argue that uh, it's public health that has made the huge sure. impacts of infectious disease. Part of Western and, medicine, if you will. But I wonder, Ed, whether there was a public...